So now let's talk about a few chapters out of the books here. Now. It's fair to say, sadly for years I mocked my wife with the bifocals and then my reading started to go bad. So I keep, keep the house populated with uh, reading glasses everywhere. Okay, three chapters on mythical man month. Why did the Tower of Babel fail? <clears throat> I thought this was interesting. He said, you know, they had a clear mission. They had the manpower. They had materials. There was no deadline. There was no technology. What was the problem? Uh, he said, you know, communication and thus organization. Uh, <clears throat> this is, this is going to be a recurring theme issues of communication organization because, again, unless you're just programming by yourself, software development is a very social act. Among your team, in, you know, communications with your team members, communications with uh, upper management, communications with the end users. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, posts of mine that you're going to read in one of the later sets is called Negotiations and Love Songs, uh, in which I present a brief argument that actually game theory is applicable to software development because you have these three parties who are looking at very different outcomes that they're interested in. Uh, and we don't always appreciate the depth of those differences as far as, you know, what the developers care about versus what management cares about versus what end users care about. Any thoughts before we dive into more of this? Okay. <clears throat> now, he talks about the project workbook. He starts to say, well, maybe you could do something with computer files. Of course, nowadays, we're going to be using GitHub. That's going to be your project workbook. Uh, though you would be surprised, again, having reviewed a lot of failed or troubled projects, you'd be surprised how many projects do a very poor job of having a central point to organize information. Uh, how much the, the, the documentation doesn't exist, it's half finished, and, and we'll talk later in the semester about the eternal trade-off between documenting and not documenting. I, I still haven't seen it resolved after 40 years. Uh, but it's very useful for communication within the group to have the concept of configuration management, repository, Source code control, actually, all documents under control, so on and so forth. Communications challenges with N workers on a project, there are N squared minus N divided by two possible interfaces and two of the N possible sets of workers. Uh, this is why you have org charts, which is why you have lines of communication. It's not about, well, actually, in many organizations, it is about power and authority. But that said, even when it's not about power and authority, it is about trying to reduce the number of potential channels of communication uh, so that actual communication can get done. This is why you have division of labor, specialization of function. Again, Brooks argues that the, key pro the project manager and chief architect need to be different people. Their priorities conflict. They really do. And, you know, as I said last week, I, at Pages for the first year and a half till we closed the venture funding, I was both the project manager and chief software architect, and I wasn't doing a good job at either one. When we closed on our venture funding, we hired Jim Hammerly from Xerox, one of the finest men I've ever known, still good friends with him. And the day he showed up at Pages, I went to my filing cabinet and filled up two boxes with all the files and so on, dealing with project management, personal files and so on, and went in and dumped them in Jim's office and said, they're yours, and started focusing on architecture full time. Uh, <clears throat> plan to throw one away. Now, Brooks, we, when we get to the, the next set of chapters we read, we'll have Brooks looking back at his original mythical man month and saying, here's what holds up and here doesn't. He originally argues in here, plan to 
throw one away, meaning throw, throw the first version of your product away, because you will anyway. You're making all your mistakes on it. You look at it and say, oh man, there's so much I put in here that just is, you know, you've got, we're, we're right back to all the technical debt, all the cruft, all the stuff that's remnants of tried and failed approaches, it's still in there. And he says, you know, you can throw it away. Uh, and, but he says in his, in his update, which was done in the mid-90s, 95, well, you know, iterative and incremental development has sort of obviated the need to throw one away. I'm not so sure. <laughs> uh, too often what you will see is you will develop a pilot or prototype system simply as a proof of concept or to show off stuff. And you will have upper management, as we said last week, say, well, why aren't you done yet? Can't we just add the features to this? Like, no, 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 this, this is poorly designed. We just wanted to demonstrate. Well, no, just, just make the features work in this. You will face that pressure at some point, I, I guarantee you. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I'm actually proud of myself professionally was at Pages, we were doing venture funding. I had a prototype to demonstrate the user interface concepts for a drag and drop interface on document creation and changing design models and so on. And when we closed on the funding and hired our last few engineers, I put that whole source code aside and we started fresh with zero source code. Because I knew, I knew deeply all the very quick and dirty stuff I had done <laughs> to make that demo work. I mean, it was, it was, there was some really ugly stuff in there. I mean, very ugly stuff. And I knew that if we tried to build on it, the whole thing would just crash and burn. Uh, so only after your first cut at implementing something do you see how you should have done it. This is why we have, again, good incremental or iterative development says, okay, we learn stuff. You have to learn how to throw code away. You have to learn how to look at stuff and say, I can do this. And you're often not given this choice. I, I have this conversation on a regular basis with uh, my daughter at Solution Reach, uh, who literally had the situation. There was there was a new project that she and a few others were on. They had a deadline. They did. They took some real quick and dirty shortcuts to get into production, uh, with the ostensible promise that they could go up and clean up later. And now the management is saying, no, no, let's just push ahead. And then she and the others are saying, no, 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 you don't understand. This whole thing is going to crash and burn like a house of cards if we keep pushing ahead on this. You know, we did stuff quick and dirty just to get it to the site. We cannot scale this tenfold with what we used. Observations, experience, <coughs> things you've seen? Yes? Is that more of a question? Like, how would you avoid those situations? Or when you choose to say, no, we will not do this, even though everyone else is telling you to just keep going forward? I'm, I'm going to tell you one of the most painful truths in, in employment, period, because I, I heard this from, at a software development conference about a little over 20 years ago, uh, and I realized immediately how true it was. The only way you can affect change in an organization is to go in, go in every day prepared to be fired. <laughs> and that's a terrifying truth, but let me tell you, it's really, it's, it's one of the advantages of being a self-employed consultant. Uh, you can tell very uncomfortable truths, and sometimes they, they're like, okay, well, we just don't need you anymore. It's like, fine, that's fine. You know, as long as you pay your bills, I don't care. Uh, it can be much harder when, you know, you're a full-time employee, you have, you know, maybe a spouse and kids, uh, and you're faced with a situation where it's kind of like, this is the wrong course, and what are we going to do? Uh, and sometimes you can't afford to be fired. And the best thing to do in that case, and I've done this before, is document everything. Write a memo, write an email. Eric, same place where the Iridium project, you're starting up another project. Uh, doing network management for a big telecom company. And uh, I got dragged in, you know, as the ostensible chief architect relatively late. We had this meeting uh, around the 1st of November because we just delivered our delivery on time for the next build for our stuff for Eric or for the Iridium. 
So I show up at this meeting on this new project. And they say, okay, this is, you know, we're going to be using this software development environment. And we're doing this. We're going to start coding. Uh, first of February, we'll be done coding. First of April, we'll do a month of testing and we'll deliver. Who signs up for this? You know, so who's, who's in favor? They're going around the table and they get to me and I said, no, I don't sign up for this at all. <laughs> I said, we have no architecture. We're using a 1.0 release of a development environment that none of our developers have ever shipped, coded a shipping product on in a language that none of them are familiar with. This is the SN.1. I said, we don't know what we're building yet. How can we say we're going to start coding on this date and we're going to be done by that date? And I went back to my, my cubicle and wrote them an email with 13 risks that I saw in this project. Uh, and sent it to the vice president of the division who wrote me back and said thank you for sharing and shut up an architect. Uh, but of course I was a little too feisty for that. So about six weeks later, so now we're, no, about uh, uh, 10 weeks later, we're in mid-January. I dug up that same email, reset it. Not just the VP, but all the upper managers. And pointed out that 12 of the 13 risks I had identified had come to pass. And that we were already slipping. Uh, and uh, when they got to about April, they decided they just, you know, and it was, it was an amiable departure. And they said, well, you know, we're not sure we have any of your services anymore. And, uh, but I kept in touch. and. The project at that point, the deadline had slipped a month. Then I got word back it had slipped a further two months, and then I got word back it had been canceled altogether by the customer. It doesn't pay to ignore risks. Really, you're going to face. You really are going to face that situation most likely at some time. Best you can do is document and say, "Okay, this is why things are going to go wrong." This is. I mean, this this is a conversation I've had with my daughter Crystal because she's faced that. And I said. Send them an email, point out the risk, say, you know, I'll do what you asked me to do, but this is what the consequences are going to be if we don't take care of this. And so at the very least, they cannot come back to you later and say, why did, you know, why didn't you tell me, or why did this all go wrong? It's kind of like, guys, I told you. We did tell you. Uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily help. The project can fail, and you end up being laid off because the company's going down the tube. So at least she'll know you were right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, Sadly, sadly, there is some satisfaction in that. <laughs> okay, plan the organization for change. Uh, this is, he touches on this, and we will we'll probably, I, I think DeMarc and Lister also touch on this, so we're going to talk about this. This is a fundamental failing through most of the IT industry, which is there is no technical track for advancement. It's kind of like junior engineer, engineer, senior engineer, now we want you to be a manager. Uh, and, and there are engineers who want to be managers and do so on and so forth, but frankly, most of us don't. Uh, there are organizations uh, which have had separate parallel management technical tracks, but sadly they are few and far between. And one of the issues, this, this frankly is one of the issues why you see a lot of developers who will get out there, be out there for 10 years, and then they go into consulting because their only other option is to start going on a management track uh, with an organization that they're in and they don't, want, they don't want to be a manager there and there's no sufficiently senior technical track there. Brooks also talks in chapter 11 about the issue of maintenance which we've talked about. Most maintenance work is adding new features to existing systems and that maintenance work destabilizes the system. <clears throat> Unless you've really taken the time to clean up the implementation, you, you, again, we're back to shipping systems have a lot of cruft, a lot of leftover artifacts from decisions that were made. They may be poor design decisions, they may be uh, necessary but unfortunate design decisions, and you now have 
this foundation uh, of, say, a modest house, and you're trying to build a fortress on it. <laughs> and you're starting to stress the foundation. You start to run into scalability problems. You start to run into data consistency problems. You start to run into uh, transmission problems. You know, what's happening to the data? <coughs> the, uh, the, the comment here, he says, his observation is that less on maintenance systems, less effort is spent on fixing the original design flaws and more is spent on fixing flaws introduced by other fixes and usually by other additions. Any thoughts or observations? Come on, I know some of you have done this stuff. How many of you have worked on trying to make changes to existing software? And what's been your experience? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's our, yeah, that pretty much jumps up like, ah! Yes? Um, I guess one of the experiences is that you sort of narrow in the set of available inputs as it were. So if you've got software which works for all these kinds of things and you say, well, now I need it to also do this, then you can't expand the inputs. You can only shrink them. So every time you do it, it starts to shrink more and more until you only have one way this will work. Yeah, yep. And that's, that's an important, again, you know, Brooks talks about this. Uh, some of the other authors you'll find will talk about this. People don't appreciate how complex software is. How, how literally, the the astronomical number of internal states, different states that a piece of software can have. Uh, it's it's sort of amazing, and sometimes that it works at all. Uh, <laughs> to be quite honest, but. <clears throat> The problem is, is that it's it's often pretty creaky, and if you start to do stuff, you know, we're going to add this feature, make it work, do this, and so on, it gets creakier and creakier and creakier. Uh, I have quoted this first line any number of times as an expert witness in failed IT projects. I do my analysis, and this is this is a truth that you need to embrace. Most project slips don't happen because, oh my gosh, this just happened and this is going to take us another six months. What it tends to be is a cumulative slip today, slip today, slip today, unless you have a way of tracking those individual slips. There, there tends to build this mindset of, oh yeah, well yeah, we're, we're late on this and this, and this but we, we can just work extra hard for the next few weeks and we'll make it all. Uh, and that doesn't happen. Uh, well, I can't tell you the number of, of failed or troubled projects I've reviewed where it's just, it's just a constant drip, drip, drip of stuff slipping. <coughs> Part of the problem is that... It's not blow up. Yeah, I was going to say. I don't like it. We'll talk about this later in the course. It's a real problem of project metrics. It is very hard to come up with a metric that is concrete, specific, measurable. It tells you exactly how close you are to completion. Uh, most, most metrics are done because they're easy to be done and they turn out to be pretty much useless. And this is where you get, you know, how many of you have even worked on a project where someone said, well, how, how far along is it? Oh, we're about 80% done. You know? Just about every project. And it's like, based on what? What are you basing that statement on? How do you know we're 80% done? That means you know exactly the other 20% we need to do and how long it's going to take. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've mentioned the 90-90 rule, and I think it's in some of the readings, you know. 90% of the project takes the first 90% of the schedule, and the remaining 10% takes the other 90%. That's the deferral of all the unknown information and the hard tasks towards the end. Uh, I thought I was clever many years ago because of my observation, which I mentioned to you about how project slips always seem to happen three weeks before. And then I went back and reread Brooks and he had it in there. But there was analysis that, you know, underestimations of project schedule do not change until about three weeks before. This is, this is scarily true. I can't tell you the number of projects because when I, when I review a failed project for as an expert witness, what I do is I get all the relevant documents in chronological order, and I read through them. 
and I can see the story. And what I prefer is the internal documents from the other side because they're being honest with themselves. I love, I love emails from engineers. Engineers are brutally honest about themselves and about their fellow engineers on their side. <laughs> uh, one of the very, very first cases I did as an expert witness, I had an email from an engineer on the other side saying, I can't believe we're charging the customer $100,000 and delivering this garbage. Uh, their lawyers tried really hard to suppress that email and didn't. Uh, weren't able to. <clears throat> but, I'll see this, it's, it's kind of like, they keep saying, you know, we'll just work hard, we'll work hard, we'll work hard, we'll work hard, and they get to that magic three or four weeks. Uh, and, and one of the best examples that, that Fannie Mae got dragged into their Y2K remediation effort because I was a direct report to Carol Teasley, who was the VP of Object Technology at Fannie Mae. She was given Y2K responsibility, so she dragged me in. And they were supposed to have all their Y2K, yes? Um, I'm just, just going to wait till I... Okay. They're supposed to have all their Y2K remediation done by the end of 98. And all the divisions had this, you know, classic green, yellow, red reporting system. And they were all reporting, you know, a few yellows, but they're all reporting green, all reporting green, all reporting green. And once again, this was like three weeks before the end of the year when they're supposed to have this done. And she goes in for the weekly meeting and suddenly almost all the reports are yellow or red. She looked around the room and said, tell me what you know now that you didn't know a week ago. And there was dead silence. Because they all knew that their projects weren't doing well. They just weren't willing to report it. Uh, you've got a question. Yes. How does a project that gets to be a year late one day at a time? What some of the factors that were included in the book are things like, this person had to be at a meeting, this person had a family emergency, this person's sick. What is a way that, especially if you're a manager, to try and relegate that? Do you try and have one day a week where, okay, we expect you to be at work all day. I mean, if you have a very rare family emergency, that's understandable, but these four days, you have to be in. The, first, the last day is kind of a, like, that's the day to take weird meetings. That's the day to do, to take kind of off stuff. How, how, do, we, how do we fix this? Realistic scheduling. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, we talked about that some last week, we'll talk about it more. Uh, part of it is a lot of the IT industry operates on a, his, a heroic model of software development, which is simply, well, we'll just have everyone work 60 hours a week. We'll get it done. Now, if you have developers who are very productive and can work 60 hours a week, you know, God bless them. We love those kind of developers. But as DeMarco and Lister will point out, and we'll see is that it's hard to get more than about 40 hours of real effective work out of a programmer in a week because then you start to burn out. And, and not burn out the way I burned out in the program for four years. Burn out kind of like, uh, I'm going to check my email. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go look at Facebook. You know, I'm going to look at this. There, you, you sort of hit a wall after a certain amount of intellectual effort and it can be hard. The, uh, this is also, and, and we'll talk a lot about this with Mark and Lister. Uh, let me ask you, when do you do your best coding? <laughs> anyway? I was gonna say after a long break between projects. <laughs> I was gonna say just this past summer, like I had a personal goal, because I was reading about productivity and how to use your time. Like when I got in at 9 a.m. at my internship, mm -hmm. I would not check email, I would not I would just go straight on the hardest problems and tackle them. And then like maybe later at like 12, you know, then check email or check updates. Like they just, you know, when you, you need those breaks in that time, you're most productive. Yeah. Other, other observations? Most of my most productive, oh yeah, call. I was going to say after like two hours of easing into it, then you have like a good eight hour like frenzy, you know. We will, we will talk about the issue of flow. Uh, at Pages, my best coding was all, always after about 7 o'clock at night. The phone stopped ringing. There were no meetings. Uh, I didn't have, you know, the CEO or the director of marketing stopping in my office to talk to me about something. My body was just tired enough that it's, it ceased. I didn't feel restless. I was just kind of tired. 
And I'd get into a flow and I'd code till about 3 a.m. And it was just, it was, it was quiet. People were leaving me alone. Of course, we had email back in those days, early 90s, but nothing like today. Uh, didn't have social, well, we had social media stuff, like CompuServe and Vix and so on. But the, uh, but the point is, is that, to get back to your question, it's learning to correctly estimate and to plan for that lack of productivity. And when it happens, when you have things happen, immediately add it to the schedule, flag it. Because again, you have this sort of, <clears throat> I don't want to, well, I don't want to pass bad news uphill. Uh, again, I wrote a number of years ago, my observation for thermocline of truth. Do you know what thermocline is? Thermocline is a, how many of you have ever swum in a lake? Okay. What's the first foot of water on the lake like? What's, what's the water about a foot below that like? So it's often very cold. That's a thermocline. You get this situation, bodies of water. It happens in the ocean, but the thermocline tends to be much bigger there. Where you get a very warm layer and then a very cold layer. And this can actually separate what life can rise above the thermocline. Both in the ocean and the lakes, you often have particularly microscopic life that can't punch up. Well, my observation, and it's not original because Brooks talks about it and because uh, Weinberg talks about the psychology of computer programming, is that you have in a project, I my article because I've got a nice diagram here, you have a thermocline of truth. You have a point in the project below which everyone knows how the project is really going. And above it, People are like, oh, no, the project is great. There's no problem. Uh, how, how many of you in your internships and other projects have seen that where the people in the trenches actually know what's happening and the people in management think everything is just tickety-boo? Yeah, that's the thermocline of truth. Uh, and what happens, in, in fact, this, this relates to the three-week thing, is that <clears throat> we say this is the point at which people actually know what's going on. As you get closer and closer to the deadline, it starts moving up because it becomes harder and harder to deny where things actually are. Uh, and this is exactly what uh, you know, Brooks says. People aren't willing to tell to pass bad news uphill, and then you get to the orders of ignorance. Often, they don't know the news is bad. In other words, they, they, it's, it's, you have sort of two situations. One is, you know, I'm... I'm at a certain level of management, and I'm getting rumblings that the project's in trouble, but I'm not willing to go up, up, upstairs and say the project's in trouble, so I pass them. The other is I'm a manager at a certain level as far as I can tell the project's fine. Because I lack sufficient visibility, because the developers themselves may not know the project's in trouble yet. Uh, the problem, again, where we'll have much more discussion on metrics is, is it's very difficult to come up with objective metrics that tell you where your project actually is at and how much you, how much remains to be completed. Uh, we'll have a, a more extensive discussion on it later. Any thoughts or observations from your own experiences or questions? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. So, Catherine, right? Yeah. Okay. So is this something you could get an organization to actually that, or is it just something where it's here and you just have to deal with it? No. It doesn't happen in good organizations. Management. Here, here's here's the issue, and I actually had an argument with Jerry. If you go back and read this article on my one of my websites, you see I had a bit of an argument with Jerry Weinberg at it about it because he said, "No, no, upper management wants to know what's happening." It's like Jerry, no, no. I have been in. I've gone into too many organizations where it was very clear upper management did not at all want to hear bad news. Uh, their idea of management was don't bring me don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Uh, that's that's a classic piece of management speak. And when it comes to software, it's like no no we actually have problems. We don't have solutions yet. We don't know what solutions are. Uh, the my big lesson on this was at Pages, which I mentioned was a year late in shipping. I saw certain problems, and I thought, well, they must, they're obvious to me. They must be obvious to everyone else on the senior staff. 
Uh, and at some point, I realized, no, they're not obvious to everyone else on the senior staff. And so I started sort of standing up and waving my hands. This is my image. It's kind of like, hey, guys, bridge is out. This is, we've got some problems here. Uh, and that directly led, because after pages closed down, because you know, grants for our money didn't have sales and so on, was when I worked at Eric. And it's why at Eric, I wrote this memo right off the bat. It's kind of like, no, I'm not going to sit here silently. I'm going to say, hey, <laughs> we, we, boy, do we have problems here on this, this, this new project. Uh, and uh, we will talk more about metrics later in there. But this is part of the core issue is not only is software hard to estimate ahead of time, it's hard to estimate while the project's in progress to know just what it's going to take. And this is why you get projects that reach what seems to be the proverbial 80 or 90 percent completion and then go along for just the same amount of time as it took to get to 80 or 90 percent. Because now you're dealing with all the unknowns, you're dealing with all the hard problems, and each problem you solve, you uncover something new. Uh, assignments for next class. Oh, the podcasts are going to move to before class. So, uh, and I know a few of you missed. Just send me an email this week, and I'll, I'll I'll be forgiving for the first few weeks while you sort of learn the the, uh, the rhythm of things. Uh, create your teams repository. Link it to the main wiki page. Create your teams org chart and roles responsibility document. Put in your seven billable hours. Uh, Sort of a talk, you know, I know you guys are setting up a Slack for yourselves, you know, get all your meta tools in place for communication. Figure out how you're going to talk to each other, how you're going to meet as a team, virtually or physically. Uh, the, uh, if you haven't already read Five Orders of Ignorance, read it. It's a short read. Uh, Webster One is a short read. It's, you know, we're, we're talking... I think, I think it's two or three of my posts, and you're talking maybe 15 minutes for me like that. I don't tend to write lengthy posts. Uh, chapters, the, the, the Brooks stuff is going to be a bit longer because this includes one of his most important papers that was written after the original publication of the Man Month called No Silver Bullet. And he's the one who really popularized the concept of you know, referring to a silver bullet as some magic solution to a particular management issue. Uh, he wrote this back in, uh, I want to say, 88. I could be wrong on that. Uh, and his assessment is that software industry is always looking for a silver bullet. Oh, this technology or this methodology is going to cure all our problems, you know. And it never does. Uh, it's just hard stuff, period. And then the, he has a couple. He has, I think that's 16, 17, I believe, is him dealing with responses to no silver bullet and 17 and 18 and 19 are him looking back at his original mythical mammoth. Uh, the first set of chapters of mythical mammoth are identical to what was printed in 1975 edition. And then he's got some chapters that were added on and I believe it's 18 and 19 are him looking back and saying, here's what holds up, here's what doesn't. Uh, so that's what you've got. You've got, uh, you know, another, well, you can take whatever time you want or don't want for team meetings. Uh, and we'll see you all next Monday. But, sorry, that took a little longer than I thought, but I'll try to keep it to make sure you guys get some good time for team meetings. If you have any more questions, come and see me. I have 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah.